This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. So chapter 12 in the notes, inventory. There's really not a lot to say about it. You know, you should know from your early days, either from F3 or equivalent, or from your university days, that all current assets are valued at the lower of cost and a net realizable value. Inventory, obviously, is the classic example of net realizable value valuations of inventory. The accruals concept requires revenues associated costs to be matched. And if I've bought some goods and I haven't sold them, if they're still in my inventory, then it's not an expense of this year, it's an expense of next year. Inventory comprises raw material, production supplies, work in progress, finished goods, goods in a saleable condition. So it's all or any of those. The valuation, law of cost and NRV. Cost includes all those costs incurred bringing the inventory to its present location and condition, including purchase costs, conversion costs and others. And in determining inventory value, we do it on a line-by-line -line basis. So if we have a line of inventory which is no longer fashionable or it's technologically obsolete, and then we would value that at net realizable value. If we have a line of inventory which is selling very profitably, then we'll value that at cost. We do it on a line-by-line -line basis each, and individually as well. If I count the desks in the room here, and, and there are 50 desks, but this particular one here is damaged, then I will value that one as a damaged value, NRV, and I will value all the others at cost. Purchase costing comprises purchase price, import duties and other taxes and non-recoverable taxes therefore. If I'm not a PVN registered, if I'm not VAT registered, then the purchase cost will include the VAT. But if I am VAT registered, then the purchase cost will exclude the VAT. Carriage inwards, bringing the inventory to its current location and condition. But we exclude discounts, rebates, a rebate is um, uh, a refund of part of the purchase price. It's like a discount, it's another word really for a discount. And other similar deductions. We do not include or take into account trade discounts. A trade discount is an automatic reduction from the selling price by the seller. So if he gives me a 10% trade discount on goods costing $100 to you, because I'm in the business, he may give me a trade discount and will only invoice me then at $100 minus 10%. He would only invoice me 90 If he offers also a cash discount, because I pay quickly, then the cash discount is a, a finance income. It's... it's um, a reward for paying quickly and has no effect on the value of the purchase. Its only effect is to make me pay less than I would otherwise have to do. So if he's invoiced me at $90, having deducted 10% trade discount, if he now gives me another 5% cash discount, the inventory is still valued at 90 not therefore at £85.50. Is that clear? So cash discounts are not deducted from purchase costs, but a trade discount was never actually seen. When he invoices me, he will invoice me at 90. He won't invoice me at 100 minus 10% discount. He will invoice me at 90, and that will be my inventory value. Page 68, conversion costs, bringing the inventory to its current location and condition. Costs which are directly related to units of production, like direct labour, direct expenses, subcontract costs, clearly direct material, all of those will be included as part of the valuation of inventory, together with the systematic allocation of appropriate overheads, including converting materials into finished goods. Fixed production overheads are included on, on an absorption cost basis, as they should be. And fixed production overheads are included on the basis of normal activity. 
if we're having to work harder or if we work more efficiently, effectively, if we produce more goods than we had anticipated producing, uh, that would be abnormal activity. We would be recovering our fixed overheads rather quicker than we had anticipated. And so we uh, allocate and apportion fixed overheads on the basis of normal activity. In periods of abnormally high activity then, fixed overhead allocation per unit should be reduced and reassessed. Determining costs may be achieved in a number of ways. There's two identified as the acceptable methods within IFRS. There's the um, FIFO basis, the first in first out basis, and also the weighted average basis, the weighted average value of the stock. But there are others which are equally acceptable. For instance, actual cost. If I can identify a particular stock item and say that did cost me so much, and that other one there cost me so much, and that one over there cost me so much, then I would value them on an actual cost basis. I'm thinking of the business of a, a person who buys and sells used cars. They know precisely how much each car has cost them when they bought it. And if that's their, their inventory, is used cars, second-hand cars, then they can value them on an actual cost basis. Another one is the retail price basis or the retail system. Uh, supermarkets, I believe, supermarkets value their inventory on a resale basis. They value them at the selling price less than acceptable profit margin. The normal profit margin it may only be 10%, say, 5%. So they will value the resale value of all their inventory and then deduct this acceptable profit margin. That is an acceptable way. Another one, and it always surprises me, another method which is acceptable in certain circumstances is to value inventory on a replacement cost basis. Now that does surprise me. And I was shocked when I first read it in an ACC answer. But things like gold, gold bars, or platinum, or tin, or zinc, or any commodity, I presume, coffee, for instance, a coffee, stock of coffee, this is allowed to be valued on a replacement cost basis, or a market cost basis. Uh, and that did shock me. LIFO down towards the bottom of that list, or at the bottom of that, that list, LIFO is no longer acceptable. The last in, first out method, which apparently is favored by Americans. And another one which is also strictly forbidden is the base cost method, where we say that we have a, a level of stock below which we will never go. We may have 2,000 kilos of sugar, for instance, and we will never run our inventory down below 2,000 kilos. So we may have 15,000 kilos in inventory, 2,000 will be valued at very, very, very historic cost, and the remaining 13,000 kilos will be valued at, at the most recent cost valuation. Now, that's not acceptable as a method, but having said that, there is the overall proviso, the overall provision within the IFRS that if you break an IFRS, you can do so. If you're in breach of an IFRS, that is acceptable so long as it leads to truer and fairer financial statements. So the ultimate objective is to get true and fair, and if it's truer and fairer to use base cost or LIFO, even though you're in breach of an IFRS, it would still be acceptable. The auditors would mention it, the company would mention it, the company would say we've applied LIFO or we've applied base cost method of valuing inventory because this, in our view, gives a truer and fairer view. And the auditors may actually draw attention to this within their audit report. But it is acceptable if it leads to a truer and fairer view. NRV may be less than cost in a number of possible situations. Increase in costs or decrease in selling price could lead to the fact that our NRV is lower than the... the um, the cost of the item. If we're not able to pass on, pass on to our customers the increase in selling price that our supplier is charging us, 
then we're unable to value it at cost because the NRV is less. But of course, that can't happen continuously forever because if I'm buying things for $100 and I'm only selling them for $95, then I'm not going to last long in business. If inventory is no longer in its best physical condition, or if finished inventory is now technically obsolete or out of fashion, or the wrong color, or found to be dangerous, or even now bound by law, for instance. We had a situation in the UK where a children's toy was bound by law because it was dangerous and was threatening the lives of children. So the person that had manufactured 500,000 of this new toy then discovered that they got 500,000 items of inventory that they were no longer able to sell. It was against the law. So NRV could be less than cost in these situations. Errors made in purchasing or production could give rise again to NRV being less than cost. Disclosure. I never like teaching disclosure because it tends to go on and on and on. There are rare circumstances where the examiner will ask you uh, about disclosure, but they are rare circumstances. And in those situations, I tend to suggest to you that disclosure is very much a common sense matter. What's the purpose of disclosure? Why do we have to disclose things in financial statements? What's the, per the underlying reason behind the disclosure requirements of IFRS? Yegors. What's the underlying reason why we have to disclose information in financial statements? To give a true and fair view. Well, yes, ultimately, to give truth. It's giving information. That's what it is. We're providing any person who may be interested enough to read the financial statements, we're providing them with that information which we think that they will possibly want to read. That's the reason for disclosure. It's to tell people, for instance, the basis of accounting, the accounting policies that we adopt, the brought forward situation, the changes in the year compared with last year. So it's giving people information about material matters within the financial statements on the understanding that these people are reading the financial statements and they are interested in this sort of thing. So it comes down to a matter of common sense. There are some technical bits within disclosure which are more than common sense, but most of it is a common sense requirement. Down here then, the accounting policy which we've adopted to measure inventory, including any cost formulae, the total carrying amount appropriately classified into raw materials, work in progress, finished goods, finished goods in a state for resale, the amount of inventory which is held at NRV, and the amounts of any reversals of previous write-downs. That's an unusual thing. If you've written inventory down because it's no longer off, you feel that it is not saleable at cost, it's saleable below cost. If we're now reversing that, then this needs to be disclosed if it's material. And the carry amount of any inventory which is promised as security for loans. There was a, a legal case a long time ago in the UK, it was called the Romalpa case. And it meant that the, the features of the case were something new in the UK that a Belgian supplier, a Dutch, Dutch supplier, was supplying raw material, raw aluminium, and was retaining title to that raw aluminium until the debt was cleared, until the buyer, Ramalpa, had paid off the debt. And Ramalpa went into liquidation, and along come these Dutch people and say, all this aluminium that is now in the possession of Ramalpa is in fact our inventory because we have retained title to it. We've retained ownership until the time that the debt is paid. This was totally new in the UK at the time that the Ramalpa case came to court. And the court said, yeah, if you buy inventory, if you buy purchases where the supplier retains title to those goods, retains ownership, even though not possession, until the debt is paid, then they have retained ownership. And all that inventory which you thought was yours actually needs to be given back to the supplier. And it's unusual, but it does actually cause us another problem because as auditors, when you attend an inventory count, 
and the client says all of this inventory is subject to reservation of title, all our inventory is claimable back by our suppliers, if we don't pay the debt, then whose inventory is it? Does the inventory still remain? Does the ownership still remain with the supplier? Or is it in fact our inventory, but it may need to be returned? Whose inventory is it? Ginta. Vita. We can ask our auditors, Anastasia. Irina? It's the suppliers, actually, no, it is the suppliers, but we treat it as though the buyers. It's the buyer's inventory. So long as there are no indications of going concern problems at the company, then even though the supplier has got this reservation of title clause within the contract, we treat it as though it were the inventory of the buyer. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, that will do for um, Chapter 12.